Hi there, ladies and gentlemen of YouTube. Today we're looking at a rather neglected film from the rather neglected Lindsay Shanty. So stop fingering that fucking piano as we check out Big Zapper. A bird like Bond. Stronger than Bond, more powerful than Bruce Lee. Are but two of the ways that have been used to describe the heroine of Big Zapper. I suppose another, another would be as the illegitimate daughter of Emma Peel with Bond, Dirty Harry, Bruce Lee and Philip Marlowe all down as possible suspects as the father. Big Zapper does offer a remarkably finger on the pulse peek into the pop culture of 1973. The Avengers were still lingering in the public's imagination. Dirty Harry had blasted his way onto the big screen. Bruce Lee had just died but wasn't about to be forgotten. The British sex comedy lay just around the corner and incredibly you'll find evidence of all this in Big Zapper. The film also represents a notable attempt to establish the female-led action film as a genre in Britain. And while I'm not sure the film was entirely successful in that aim, it did at least have the ripple causing effect of spawning a sequel, as well as similar films like 1979's The Golden Lady. And at a stretch I suppose you could also include Donovan Winter's The Deadly Females and the 1980s TV series Cat's Eyes as female actioners that Big Zapper proudly paved the way for. The Big Zapper of the title is Harriet Zappa, a super cool, high-kicking private eye, played by the versatile and highly likeable Linda Marlowe. The character is best described by the film's own publicity blurb, which so impressed Cinema X magazine that they republished it in its entirety. So, if it's good enough for Cinema X magazine, it's good enough for me. She carries a pair of 357 Magnums that can blow your head off and a pair of 38s that can knock your eyes out. She's got long legs and a short fuse, expert at karate, judo, boxing and cool. She's got the sting of a scorpion, the instincts of an alley cat, the kick of a mule and a mind like a steel trap. Because in her world of insane villains, 300 pound bodyguards, hired shooters, knife fighters, blackjack experts and samurai swordsmen, a girl can't be too careful. Big Zapper is all any man could want, and twice as much as he could handle. Believe me, if you need the toughest, deadliest private eye in town, the best man in town is Linda Marlowe. So, you're never going to be able to top that for an introduction, are you? Big Zapper begins in a bombastic fashion, laying out its exploitation film credentials up front. As a topless and terrified woman, runs around the English countryside trying to escape from two thugs only to be captured by them and then sadistically murdered by their cape-wearing boss. Enter Harriet Zapper, who is hired to find out what has happened to the missing woman by the woman's father, Jeremiah Horn. Not, however, before encountering some sexist resistance from Horn, who scoffs at the idea of hiring a woman to do this job. Horn, however, quickly changes his mind when Miss Zapper proves her worth by pulling a few kung fu moves on him and also knocking out the toughest of his bodyguards because Big Zapper don't mess about. Big Zap's subsequent investigation into the missing daughter, Pandy Horn, brings her into contact with Pandy's killer, Kono, a pimp, banknote forger and the biggest big shot in the West End. Much to the film's benefit, Kono also happens to be one of the most hot-headed characters to ever grace the screen, an aggressive wild man prone to psychotic outbursts, mainly aimed in the direction of his do-gooding girlfriend, played by Penny Irving. Kono's crazy outbursts lend the film some highly requotable dialogue. Stop fingering that fucking piano. Jesus wants me for a sunbeam, and a fucking fine sunbeam I'll be. Kono is played by an actor called Gary Hope, who was blessed, or maybe cursed, with a slight facial and strong vocal resemblance to Nicholas Parsons. A comparison that adds a further layer of ridiculous to this film and offers up the idea of the career Nicholas Parsons could have had had he followed the path of playing intense, sexually perverse screen villains rather than as a game show host or a comedy straight man. At times it's as if Big Zapper comes from some alternative universe, one in which David Lynch decided to cast Nicholas Parsons rather than Dennis Hopper in the role of Frank Booth in Blue Velvet. Kono soon finds that pimping ain't easy, especially when Harriet Zapper is around. 
While Pandy's two brothers are quickly dispatched of when they try to avenge their sister's death, Big Zapper proves to be quite the unstoppable force. One that dispatches dozens of Kono's goons with Kung Fu, knives, swords, her beloved pair of magnums, even mowing down a whole army of them at one point with a giant machine gun between her legs. An unforgettable image which understandably ended up on the film's poster. The exact kill count in the film is said to be 72. Miss Zapper even brings down a helicopter at one point. One hopes that Jeremiah Hall was paying her well for all this. Big Zapper is instantly recognisable as the work of Lindsay Shanty, a truly maverick filmmaker who from the 1970s onwards preferred to work independently from any studio system, self-producing his films along with his partner Elizabeth Gray. Despite often being addled by low budgets as a, as a result, Shanty proved to be quite the jack of all genres. He made horror films, war films, westerns, post-apocalyptic films, but left to his own devices, seemed to gravitate mostly towards James Bond spoofs, his first being Licensed to Kill in 1965, and he was still knocking those out until the early 1990s. I suppose Big Zapper could be considered a female offshoot or female spin-off from his 007 parodies. Its characters certainly feel like they belong in the same universe as his Bond parodies, which are films populated by absurd gadgets, cartoonish violence and freakish villains. Technically, one character from Big Zapper does also exist in Shantish Bond parodies, since Gary Hope reprises the Kono character in all but naming two of them, firstly in Licence to Love and Kill, and even more so in Number One Gun, where despite sporting a Russian accent, he's clearly channel channeling the Kono character once more, and even gets a chance to revisit the character's pimptastic wardrobe. Shantif's Bond parodies can be an acquired taste. From personal experience, I found your enjoyment of those films tends to depend on your mindset at the time. When I've been in a light, silly mood, those films can be just a ticket. But when I've tried to approach them in a more serious mindset, i found those films to be quite juvenile and increasingly irritating. In all the times I've watched Big Zapper, though, I've never been anything but thoroughly entertained by it. It's a film that never runs out of steam. With the Bond parodies, you sort of know where you are with those films. You know everything's going to be pitched at a zany level, and you're never going to be troubled or disturbed by anything in them. Whereas the Big Zapper films feel edgier, grittier, and less predictable. Like Harriet Zapper herself, you're never quite sure what lies behind the next corner in these films. Will Big Zapper be goofy and trying to make you laugh? Or will it be disturbing with some sexualised violence? The death of the Penny Irving character is especially harrowing and difficult to sit through. Like Harriet Zappa herself, this is a film that is difficult to pin down. First and foremost, I suppose it's a black comedy, but it also successfully functions as an action film and an exploitation film. It also adventurously draws on many Eastern genres like the martial arts film, and to a lesser extent the Japanese sword fighting film, an influence which grows even greater in the film's sequel, Zappa's Blade of Vengeance. Shanti does strike you as a filmmaker who is open to all manner of film genres. Perhaps the fact that he was Canadian by birth meant that he didn't carry around with him the stuffy preconceptions of what genres didn't have a place in British cinema that many British-born filmmakers had. As a British film that was a considerable depth to Kung Fu movies, Big Zappa must be fairly unique in that respect, which in itself is quite surprising if you think about it given what impact martial arts movies did have on 70s British culture. What with the popularity of Bruce Lee, Carl Douglas's Kung Fu fighting going to number one in the charts, and those youthful hooligans bringing these things along with them to football matches. Martial arts cinema seems to be something British culture was enamoured with, but rarely sought to emulate. Apart from Big Zapper, the only British cinema Kung Fu film crossover that I can come up with is Hammer's the Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires. But as that film was made with the collaboration of the Shaw Brothers and featured Hong Kong location shooting and a Chinese supporting cast, The Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires feels more like an Eastern action film itself rather than a homegrown answer to the genre, like Big Zapper. Of course, we cannot overlook the film's two greatest strengths, which are the amazing charismatic star turns by Linda Marlowe and Gary Hope. 
Neither were unfamiliar with acting in Shanti's films. Both had previously had secondary roles in his film Night After Night After Night, and Hope's association with him stretches back even further than that. Both, however, really step out from the background and take centre stage with this film, with Marlowe's unflappable coolness providing an 180 degree contrast to Hope's hot headed intensity. I've often felt that out of respect to Gary Hope's contribution to the film, Big Zapper should have been called Big Zapper Meets Kono or Big Zapper vs Kono, since the film often feels like an almighty tug of war between these two characters for the audience's attention. This film ain't big enough for both of them, that's for sure. I only wish that Shantip had made as many Big Zappa films as he did James Bond parodies. While Big Zappa was distributed by Exploitation Outfit Miracle Films, the sequel, Zappa's Blade of Vengeance, was very badly distributed by Rank. Shantip once claimed that one of the Rank honchos had wanted him to recast the role of Harriet Zappa for the sequel and Shantif believes Zappa's Blade of Vengeance was shoddily treated by Rank due to his refusal to do so. Zappa's Blade of Vengeance sat on the shelf for over a year before being released as a second feature. It was also heavily cut to get an AA rating, and was retitled The Swordsman, not even cluing audiences in on the fact that this was the sequel to Big Zappa. Sadly, Zappa's Blade of Vengeance marked the end of the line for Harriet Zappa, Yet the character had so much more potential. In a perfect world there could have been further sequels, a TV series, a children's toy line. It is frustrating to think that the character's potential was never fully realised due it seems to movie industry stupidity and petty vindictiveness. Like all of Shantish self-produced films, Big Zappa has never made it to DVD or Blu-ray. As to why that is, the story I've heard, and I have to emphasise this is just a story I've heard, I'm not claiming any of this to be the gospel truth, is that Shantif had two separate families, and that from the 1960s up until his death he was married to a woman in Canada and had two daughters from that marriage, but he also had two sons from his relationship with Elizabeth Grey. When Shantif died, his will, I believe, is meant to have left the rights to his films to one of the Canadian daughters, but this has been disputed by one of the British sons, who also claims ownership of his father's films. So, due to this rather complex sounding situation, Shanti's self-produced films appear to be in Wright's limbo, and currently he is only represented on DVD by early films that he was a director for hire on, like Devil Doll, Curse of the Voodoo and The Million Eyes of Sumeru. Let's not end this on a downbeat note though. And while it might seem an odd thing to wish for, I really hope by the time you're watching this, everything I've just said will be hopelessly out of date, and the rights issues to these films will have been resolved, and you're watching this alongside your Big Zapper Blu-ray box set, containing both films, hours and hours of extras, and Big Zapper and Kono action figures thrown in for good measure. I really hope by the time you watch this, these films have been reappraised as cult classics, and Harriet Zappa has been rightly recognised as one of the great action heroines of 1970s exploitation cinema. Viva Zappa! Anyway, that's all for now, so all that remains for me to say, to say is good night and God bless.